Hi everyone, I'm Chris Brousseau. I'm an NLP research scientist at LifePod Solutions and we'll be talking to you about understanding human machine conversation patterns for seniors aging in place. Specifically, how we can build a system to account for everything that they say and how we can improve our current human machine conversation patterns. Um, so first off, what is LifePod? LifePod is the, I guess, the first proactive voice caregiving service that in the world. Um, we're the first one, the first company to build a machine that not only uses reactive voice commands the way that many, many machines that we are already aware of do, but it, it allows it to play proactive routines that can help, especially with healthcare and caring for seniors aging in place and chronically ill patients. Those are the main people that we work with. And like I said, I'm an NLP research scientist, so I spend a lot of time studying this sort of thing. And I'm presenting a system for you guys that hopefully will be really easy to follow and hopefully will also be able to help you to improve your own customer machine interactions. So here's our first little bit of data. This is just a very simple bag of words model of the top 15 words that everyone says to our machine. So yes, think, play, no, okay, music did stop, is what, whether, yeah, me, can. Those are the top 15 words that everyone says. All of these users experienced what's called randomization or the introduction of variety into the routines that they see. Here's the exact same thing, but with only users that experienced personalization or the introduction of customizability into their routines. Now I'm gonna go back and forth between these for a second. Here's the first one again. See if you can notice any differences between the first one and the second one that don't have anything to do with numbers. Here's the second one. First one again. Second one. So something that you should have noticed is the fact that on this first one we have play, we have music, we have weather which those represent reactive routines. Those are, those are when the customer asks us to play some music or asks us for the weather or asks us to play a CD or a podcast or something. Um, those aren't present within the customizable one. This, this difference is really significant because it tells us that people who received variety or randomization into their in, into their routine structure, use our device differently than the people that received customizability. And how do they use it differently? Well, they tend to interact with the device on their own time as well. They, they, re, they give the device reactive commands and I'm not showing you this data, but they actually respond more consistently to the, the device as well. I'm gonna share with you a particular paradigm from last year, there's a, a game called Hades that came out from Supergiant Studios that created an endless experience, which is the reason why they were able to win Game of the Year in the face of a whole lot of larger AAA games and companies that to a lot of people might seem better. So how were they able to do this? Um, I feel like I've been able to break down a couple of things that they've done that, that um, really helped them. Number one is building that experience for every player. The way that they were able to do this is they really put in a lot of work behind the scenes. They wrote over 330,000 words for their script, which for any of you out there who are kind of NLP nerds like I am, that's more than the entire series of Harry Potter or the entire Game of Thrones series combined. So they, they really put in a lot of work writing the script. I'm gonna suggest a system so that you won't have to put in as much work as they did, but it's it's important to appreciate how much they actually did. They then were able to prioritize responding to the player's recent actions versus just straight randomization. So they, they essentially created a system that allowed them to account for things that the player just did. And they weren't able to predict exactly when they were going to do those things, but so it's important to have a have a system to account for those actions. And then the third one, they flipped the gaming paradigm on its head where failure was actually essential to progress through the story. 
um, death wasn't the end in in this case. And I don't want to compare that too much to our to our paradigm. However, it is important to understand that flipping that paradigm on its head was what gave them the ultimate edge to win this. So what what do we need to do to create a similar endless experience for our customers? Number one, we can try and do the same thing as Hades and predict what they will say. For Hades, it's a little bit easier because the character never actually says anything. They just would interact with the world around them and that, that says stuff. The second one is the more important one. And this is, this is the big one for Hades. We need to automatically account for what we can't predict. Um, so for us at LifePod, that has to do with what people are going to say and when they're going to say it. With Hades, that was when players were going to complete certain objectives or when something might happen so that they, they don't know exactly when it will happen. So they just have triggers that will prioritize those responses up to the top of the stack. Um, and then last, we want to be able to create responses that feel conversational and we don't want to have to write 330,000 words ourselves. So we want to generate them. Let's go into a system that might allow us to predict what people are going to say. Now, to any of you that work within automatic speech recognition or speech to text, this will probably feel very similar to you. Um, essentially, we have utterances from our customers tell me about the current traffic situation on the A1. And we perform what's called named entity recognition. For that, there are a whole bunch of open source solutions for named entity recognition. Um, but I would recommend not just using an open source one. I'd recommend taking advantage of it and fine tuning it on your own data, your own data set. Uh, but the, in point, the, the whole point of having those named entities is to allow us in the second part portion of this to perform multi-class classification and match those entities to the most similar intent. Uh, what this does is it allows us to create buckets in which to place utterances. Uh, this makes it so that our, I guess the burden is taken off of us to try to actually predict what people will say because as for any of you that study language, you'll know that one of the six characteristics of every language across the planet is that they're productive. What that means is I can say a string of words and as long as I conform to syntax and semantic rules, those words can be brand new and that sentence could never have been uttered before, but you guys will still be able to understand me. This means that the, that language has an infinite scope a sort of a double infinite scope. And so we can't actually predict everything that people will say. Bucketing gives us the ability to predict some things that are close to what we would like them to say. So that brings us to the second portion of this system, accounting for what they do say that we were unable to predict. Um, this is especially important because uh, we, we don't just want it to account for it and like mitigate risk. We'd like it to automatically be able to supplement that first portion. And a really powerful baseline for this, or I guess this is, this is better to explain what, what I mean by that. Over here on the left, you can see different vocabulary words that you might put into your intents to try and match them within a customer interaction. So if somebody's asking about the weather, they can say, hey, uh, or the device can say to them, hey, would you like to hear about the weather? They could say, all right, they could say no, they could say yes. And those are all things that we can put within our intent vocabulary. Technically, the things on the right are also things that we can put in our intent vocabulary, but they're variations that don't always get added in. For those of you working with chatbots, go go ahead and go check your intents and see, do they contain all righty? Because that's one that we've gotten before. And it's not that different than all right, but within automatic speech recognition and then another model for speech to text, a lot of this can get convoluted and the machine learning models can get hung up on the fact that they're, they're different, not only in the waveform, but they're also different 
in spelling and it might not catch that. I know that we've had some false negatives with each of these statements. So to start, we have this baseline in a naive Bayes. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with a naive Bayes, uh, the basic intuition is that you can predict the probability of X given Y by taking the probability of Y given X multiplied by the probability of X divided by the probability of Y. So over here we have the probability of an utterance being positive given that that utterance contains happy is equal to the probability of an utterance uh, an utterance containing happy being positive and multiplied by each of these multiplied by the probability of a positive utterance being occurring no matter what divided by the probability of happy occurring within an utterance so how do we want to actually use this to catch no matches or to catch things that people say that we were unable to predict? Well, we can predict the probability that something should have been caught or the probability that a given utterance is similar to things within our training vocabulary, given that they contain each word that they contain or given that they contain bigrams or trigrams, or given that they contain n grams that could be within our training vocabulary. And these are all things that we can keep track of fairly easily. And we can, this is this is especially nice in a setup because we can augment that data set very easily using utterances that people actually give that are classified correctly. So it's kind of an ever expanding data set, which is very helpful because it's probabilistic. Naive Bayes relies on statistics and on math more than on a study of language, which it wasn't ever made for language, so that's okay. But that means that it can be unreliable, especially given the scope that on the end of the naive Bayes that goes from negative infinity to zero for confidence that it's not similar versus zero to positive infinity for confidence that it is similar. Um, so to fix this gap, we have the idea of using any sort of grouping algorithm to help us leverage both unsupervised and supervised learning together to create kind of a hybrid system that allows us to mitigate as much risk as possible. You'll notice with these, even something as similar as measuring Levenstein distance, all right and all righty are only one away, which that one in this case is one seventh of the entire length of all right or one half or one third of no or yes. Now, now would be two away from no, yeah would be two away from yes. So they're all, it allows us to bias our model towards only accepting things and then automatically adding them into our training vocabulary. If the naive base both determines that it is probabilistic and whichever grouping mechanism mechanism we try or multiple grouping mechanisms between Levenstein distance, K nearest neighbor grouping or word embeddings, or you can even uh, spin up a Siamese model two LSTMs that are parallel and together to determine how similar two utterances are semantically. There's, there are a lot of data sets out there for that as well. But the point is, if it ticks all of the boxes, on here, it, it is a low Levenstein distance. The K nearest neighbor distance is low. The word embedding distance in n dimensional space, probably using PCA, is also very low. And the naive Bayes is confident that it that it is similar. Then you add it in automatically. This this allows us to be a little bit quicker. And if we do this within post processing on the speech to text after it's already been classified as matching or not matching an intent, it allows us to be, like I said, a little bit nimbler on our feet when we're responding to customers because the machine and this algorithm can essentially add in stuff to the training vocabulary and reclassify it on the fly. <laughs> the last portion of this is what I would consider the second most important 
behind accounting for things is generating. Because again, we don't want to be writing 330,000 words on our own. So here's a relevant XKCD. Uh, what made us think of this is we have this data that suggests that people appreciate variety, but they don't want to either one, know about all of the variety beforehand, or number two, pick any of that variety themselves. You have probably been to a restaurant before with a very, very, very large menu. And I don't know if you personally feel this way. Some of you may, but even if you don't personally feel this way, you probably know someone who struggles with making decisions between a whole lot of different options. Or like in the XKCD, even, even if you have very similar options, just only two of them, the fact that there are multiple options that could be good makes a lot of people freeze up. So we want to be able to pick what's on the menu for them, but we also want to make sure that it's a good thing. You know, we don't we don't want this to be like an actual restaurant where some of the some of the food could be bad or some of it could give us food poisoning or something along those lines. So what can we use to generate responses that feel conversational? They're not actually conversational, but we want them to feel that way. Uh, this is this was something that stumped us for a little while, but we've settled on something uh, essentially a combination between two things that already exist in great abundance. Number one, a natural language generative model, something like GPT-2 or 3 or BERT or you know any number of language models combined with summarization models. The reason being that summarization models uh, tend to spit out things that are semantically similar even though they're biased to be shorter in length because that's kind of the point of summarization. So we want to generate things that are semantically similar but are approximately the same length. So instead of biasing our model towards accepting shorter length utterances, we want them to be similar length or the same. Uh, so we can use transformers for that. I, I recommend causal attention. It works very nicely within this. Um, causal multi-head attention. And for us, we can, we have our own data, of course, but we also leverage several um, open source data sets for this, such as the JIRA question answer data set or question summarization data set, Stack Overflow network question summarization data set and news article summarization data sets. Uh, what this does is it, it allows our model to train on summarization, but within the end of the or the end of the model after it's already made its predictions we want to then i guess not after it's after it's already trained when we're actually making our predictions we want to instead of using some sort of greedy some sort of greedy hashing algorithm to grab similar words but keep it really short we want to grab similar words but keep it approximately the same length as whatever input was used is a self-supervised language modeling. And no attention is not all you need, but it does help a whole lot. So what does this end up doing for us? In case you're wondering, here's some example input that you can put into our model. Uh, just a reminder, it's time to take your morning medication now. And here are some example outputs that you should be able to get out of our model. Just wanted to let you know it's time to take your med morning medication now. It's about time for you to take your morning medication. Here's your reminder to take your morning medication now. Don't forget to take your morning medication now. So you can see why this would be helpful. It allows us to, in this one case, quintuple the amount of data that we have and quintuple the amount of variety that we have for responding and prompting our members. Uh, this system altogether Here's another relevant XKCD to help you laugh at machine learning. That it's it's so helpful. It's so huge within our world, and it's very helpful in NLP. But this system altogether is very robust for in interacting with users, and it requires very little maintenance. Although it does require some human supervision uh, to make sure that you know stuff doesn't slip through that accounting phase that shouldn't or 
stuff that maybe should have gone through, but I've failed one or more of the tests to that. That's where the most supervision is required is that accounting step. Uh, the second most would be on the generation step where we want to make sure that the things that it's generating are grammatical. And if they're not, maybe we can provide some small corrections where we get a basis of something that's very fairly semantically similar and we just have to do a little bit of correcting. Kind of like for translators that work in a PEMT workflow, you know, you run things through machine translation and then you go in and you post edit it. So you, the machine takes care of the brunt of the work of coming up with new things that are semantically similar and then the translator comes in and makes sure that it's correct. We, we wanted to take that and use it very similar similarly for our problem and that's close to my heart since I used to be a translator. Um, this also provides you with some safety nets so you aren't accepting too much or too little at any one time of this new user created data. Uh, most of all it has machine learning in all the places it needs it and doesn't have it anywhere else. We want to make sure that while machine learning is very great and we, we use it a lot we don't want to rely solely on it yet because it hasn't reached that position. Thank you so much for coming. Um, I'll be available for questions. And I think that's it.